Over the years I've acquired a, a few works of art, some I've bought and others I've been given or exchanged. I have a very eclectic mixture and everyone has a story and here are just a few of them. The first picture is a pastel drawing by an artist called David Blackburn. He was an artist living in Huddersfield, a student at the Royal College of Art along with David Hockney back in the 1960s and he worked exclusively in pastel. At that time it was a very unfashionable medium to use. We met in the late 1980s when he had an exhibition in London and we became good friends. On a couple of occasions I went to stay with him in Huddersfield and we would go out drawing together. I was immediately struck by his visionary quality in interpreting the landscape in a way that while it might appear abstract it has a remarkable identity, a sense of place. And my picture has an unmistakable northern feel to it, although he didn't exclusively work in, in this country, in England. But here we can recognise the fields, the dry stone walls, the horizon, and a single detail, a star which orientates the work. The transformation is from trying to understand uh, the landscape, or the nature, the structure of the landscape, the way light moves into an inner vision. And I think, it's, I think it's really the difference between prose and poetry. In prose, you probably, I'd have thought for most writers, seek for understanding, maybe it's obviously to tell a story, but you expect that story to have a beginning, an end, a middle. It exists through time. You expect your characters generally to be credible, to exist in the way that they would exist in life. Whereas I think with poetry, you could take something like the force that through the green fuse drives the flower, drives my red blood, that blasts the roots of trees, is my destroyer. The force that through the green fuse drives a flower, on the one hand you can say it's meaningless almost, on the other hand you can say it's marvellous by the sound of the words and the magic the images evol evoked. And I put myself four square on the side of poetry, which is as much about the sound of the words and the magic of words. I don't seek understanding in the pictures. I seek transformation into something else, but I'm not necessarily that involved in trying to understand. I don't want to understand particularly what I've done. I want to make a beautiful picture that takes me one step forward. Ever since I became interested in Croatian culture and particularly Croatian art, I've coveted those artists who for me convey a particular quality of this culture. Among those artists I especially admire is um, Ivan Rarabuzin, in 1972, a French critic described him as one of the greatest naive painters of all time. He has a style that is immediately recognisable. I first came across his work around 1994 when his pictures were used to illustrate a children's book. They are happy pictures. He only started painting at the age of 35 and was largely self-taught. His works are characterised by a, a dense geometric pattern of, of vegetation and cloud forms that form a rich arabesque-like structure in gentle pastel colours. I bought this painting from a little gallery in Zagreb a couple of years ago and when I first saw it I thought the, the four little houses, the group of houses, was a work of his imagination. But I've since found two more paintings with the same group. So it must be a real place. Jane Wisner was an artist I first met around the mid-1980s and I was immediately inspired by her style of drawing. She worked in a variety of mediums but it was her pen and ink drawings that I most appreciated. She loved to explore the South Downs, the undulating hills, the coombs, the winter-shaped trees and we would often take our paints and sketchbooks there and spend a day walking and drawing. She was a mentor to me and we, we drew together often. Jane liked to travel and had painted in America, Hawaii and in Tanzania in Africa where she lived for a, a while. 
In 1988, we traveled to Spain visiting Ronda and a place called Benauchen, and I discovered a landscape there of a completely different light. Of her own work, she wrote that it is possible to distill an energy and contain it within line and color on paper, and that those contemplating the results are recipients of that same energy excites me profoundly. And it is this energy I find most engaging in her work. Tom Phillips is an artist whose work I was familiar with from the late 1970s, even if I didn't know his name, as he designed the cover for one of my favourite Brian Eno albums. Back in the 1980s and 90s, it was my habit to write to people I admired in order to elicit a, a written reply. And one such person was Tom Phillips. I bought a signed copy of a book he published of an, of an altered text, which he called The Humument. This book is called A Humument, and it's based on a Victorian novel, which I've mucked about with, or added to, or taken the things from, over 50 years. I started it in 1966, and I said, the first book I, I can find for threepence, I'll work on for the rest of my life. And the first book I found was a human document. And it was a bit of luck because a human document is very helpful. It's got a huge vocabulary, it's interesting, it's a bit dusty in the Victorian sense, but one can overcome that. One can find all sorts of uh, erotic things hidden in, in Victorian language, etc. It was a brilliantly inventive work that had a precedent in the writings of the American writer William Burroughs. Phillips took each page and extracted from the text a kind of hidden poetry. He isolated particular words or a part of a sentence to reveal more pertinent text relevant to his life and experiences. It's a project he's worked on for 50 odd years and the published works have gone into many, many editions. In one of my letters, I asked him if he had any works for sale and he offered me this print to commemorate his 50th birthday with an appropriate text. And for this I paid just 50 pounds. When I was studying at the faculty in Sarajevo, between 1999 and 2000, I decided to base my dissertation on the, the artworks that were created in the city during the siege. A siege which lasted 1,395 days. It was longer than the siege of, of Leningrad. In my research, I, I was really struck to learn that while the city was completely cut off from the rest of the world, and had to endure daily bombardments and the threat of sniper fire to anyone on the streets. There were more artistic manifestations occurring in the city during this time than before or even after the ceasefire in 1995. Be it concerts, theatre exhibitions, even an underpass was used as a location for an exhibition. And I asked myself, how, how was this possible? Well, in truth, art was used to negate the war to counteract the devastation. In essence, art was a means of survival. While I was doing my research, I met a number of artists who endured the almost four years of siege, including one of the most respected of all Bosnian artists, Edin Newman Kadic, who not only graciously granted me an interview, but gave me a drawing. This is from a series called Inscriptions, and from a catalogue, I took this description. Bearing within these works is the experience of terror, the atrocities of war, not visible or obvious on the surface like wounds of an event in the figurative sense, but in the form of the presence of an inner experience, illegible writing, traces of inscriptions, strange abstracted words, unrecognisable missives on the walls of destroyed houses. This for me is one of my most valued pieces in my little collection for many reasons, uh, but particularly because of its origin.
This piece is a recent purchase and I picked it up on the street in Zagreb. I was walking through a pedestrian area and there was this artist who had laid out his pictures around the seating area. There was a surprisingly wide range of styles on paper, on card and on wood. I stopped and we chatted for quite a while. He, he always seemed to embody the notion of a starving artist living in an attic in some condemned building. I was not especially drawn to his work until I saw this one. I really liked that he'd used the end of a fruit box as his canvas, bringing to mind the work of a St. Iris artist called Alfred Wallace, who painted with ship's paint on odd bits of cardboard. Nenad had added strips of wood to fill the gaps of the fruit box. It's a playful work and shows a cat as if it were looking through a gap in a fence on which a more ferocious but comical face has been painted. Nenad Bursar had been a scriptwriter for films back in the 80s and in the 1990s he was a founding member of the Society of Outsider Art in Zagreb. Artists who worked outside of the mainstream art world exploring unconventional ideas. This piece is colourful and humorous and has a raw quality that I was particularly drawn to. So I bought it, cheaply. When I was at school, the BBC broadcasted an adaptation of the Virginia Woolf novel To the Lighthouse, back in I think, 1883. I remember being so deeply moved by the production that the next day I went to buy the book. It seemed I was not the only one since every bookshop I visited the following week had sold out of all their copies. Eventually I managed to track down a copy and read it avidly. I'd never read such a novel before. At that time I'd heard about a loose group of friends, artists and writers who were known as the Bloomsbury Group. These friends were largely centred around the painters Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant. Vanessa being the sister of Virginia Woolf. I picked up a few more books, biographies mainly, from which I could learn more about them. The more I read, the more I became intrigued. Then in the same year, in 1983, the v &A held a symposium to raise interest in preserving the house where they had lived in Sussex for over 60 years. The whole house, in fact, had become an artwork not simply with paintings, but they decorated every flat surface imaginable. I was also able to hear first-hand accounts from family members and friends intimately bound to this group and this house. I resolved immediately to get involved. I wrote to Vanessa's son, Quentin Bell, and volunteered my services, which he gratefully accepted, and by the following summer I arrived at Charleston with my tent. I camped by the pond and began to work in the house under the guidance of the chief restorer, Pauline Plummer. The following year I went back once again. It was a most magical experience. With an increasing interest in the Bloomsbury Group back then, a gallery opened up near the British Museum called the Bloomsbury Workshop. They were selling drawings and paintings on behalf of the family to raise funds for the restoration work. I was very fortunate to buy this drawing by Duncan Grant from them. It is my most treasured picture in my small collection. It is called Trafalgar Square Meeting, and there are two things about it that I really like. Firstly, that one can sit in the same location as Duncan, where he drew it, up on the plinth, near to the lions. And secondly, I like to speculate as to who the characters are. I suspect that they were people known to Duncan, could this be his friend, the art critic Clive Bell, Vanessa's husband? And could this be Lady Ottilie Morell from Garsington Manor? We'll probably never know, but the, the guessing is entertaining. <laughs> 